All right. So with me, I have Dr. Julie Greenberg. And uh, Dr. Greenberg is a licensed naturopathic doctor and registered herbalist who specializes in integrative dermatology. She is the founder of the Center for Integrative and Naturopathic Dermatology, which is a holistic clinic that approaches skin and hair problems by finding and treating the root cause. Dr. Greenberg holds degrees from Northwestern University, Stanford University, and Bastyr University. She lectures at naturopathic medical schools and is sought after to speak at conferences across the United States on the topics of hair, skin, and nails. And thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Greenberg. Appreciate you uh, agreeing to do this. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm excited just because this is really the first time we're diving into the skin and, uh, you know, which is really, I mean, relevant with any, I think, chronic health condition, but I do see it a lot with my, with my, both my Graves and Hashimoto's patients. So, so yeah, I'm really excited to uh, talk to you about this. And so can you start out by giving your, a little bit more of your background, just um, how you started to really focus on, on dermatology? Yes, um, it is actually apropos for this podcast because I, I got to dermatology through my thyroid. And, um, you know, I think that's if your uh, listeners don't know, I'm, I'm a naturopathic doctor, as you said. And naturopathic doctors, we, we say, you know, treat the whole person, which means that we look at how the organ systems interconnect with one another. So it was a very naturopathic way for me to actually get to dermatology. Uh, I went to business school in my 20s. I graduated I started having symptoms that will sound very familiar to you. Um, you know, I was very tired. I was gaining weight. I was having some hair growth. I was having some brittle hair, some dry skin. Um, and it, it turns out I had developed Hashimoto's um, thyroiditis. Um, I went and when I finally got diagnosed, you know, it was just a very um, jarring experience. It was my first real experience with a chronic health issue. And the doctor who diagnosed me was like, well, you have this autoimmune disease. You know, we don't know why it's happening. We don't really know how to fix it. Here's some thyroid hormone. You'll be on this the rest of your life. And you'll probably have trouble with, you know, fatigue and weight the rest of your life. And, you know, out, out the door I went kind of shell-shocked. And um, I really had no interest in being a doctor or anything medical before that. But I, I started researching and saying, you know, that just doesn't feel right that that's the answer I'm getting from my doctor and, and how could that be the end of the story? And the more research I did, <clears throat> the more I found that, you know, other things in the system affect the thyroid. And a lot of the chemicals that we use on our body every day for our personal care products, women use around 125 different chemicals on their bodies a day. It can impact the thyroid, right? We have endocrine disruptors. And so I started making that connection between the skin and the thyroid I started trying to make my own skincare products, trying to get the chemicals out and see if I could make myself healthier. And that was really my first uh, foray into health and my first foray into dermatology. And I just became so passionate about the skin and dermatology and what we were putting on our skin. And, and that was really the impetus that ended up in me going back to naturopathic medical school to become a naturopathic doctor and specialize in dermatology. So maybe I misheard you, but did you say that the average woman uses 125, puts 125 different chemicals on their skin every day? Yeah, you did not mishear me. Because uh, when you think about the number of products that a woman puts on her skin, you wake up in the morning, you're putting on deodorant, you wash your hair with shampoo and conditioner. Uh, we are applying you know, all sorts of makeup, uh, gels to the hair, lotions to the body. And if you just pick one personal care product, turn it over, look at the ingredients list, you're going to see a very long list of multisyllabic chemicals that, you know, are only made in a lab. And if you <clears throat> added those up and put them all together, you get to about 125 for one day. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I knew it was a lot, but if, if I had to guess, I would say maybe a few dozen uh, over a hundred. That's, that's crazy. And that's, you said average. So some people use more than uh, apply more than 125 chemicals to our body. So, uh, yeah, well, thanks. Thanks for letting us know about that. And, and so why do so many people have skin issues? Why? I mean, I, I think I know the reason, but you know, just for those out there, I mean, the gut plays a big role, which I know you're going to talk about that. So, uh, but yeah, if you could dive into why it's, it is so common in people with not only autoimmune conditions, but other health conditions as well. 
Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, our skin is a very complex organ. It is enormous. It's our largest organ. You know, it, it obviously is covering our body, but its job is so complex because it is outward facing at all times. Um, and it has to keep out most things, but let some things in. And it has to keep in most things, you know, being our blood and <laughs> uh, water, uh, but it has to let some things out, right? We have to sweat. And so, you know, you think about something like a turtle shell, that's much easier. They, they build a hard exoskeleton, nothing gets in, nothing gets out, that's it, right? It's a much simpler job. Skin, I mean, it has to be soft and supple, uh, but again, it has to be tough uh, because it's outward facing. And it's really a very complex organ. And if we think about, we're gonna to get to the gut as you said, but when we think about like, okay, what, how did we evolve? Like, how are we supposed to be taking care of our skin if we lived out in caves still? You know, we probably weren't showering all that often. Uh, we weren't using detergents and soaps. And I talked to my patients about this. It's um, pH is really important when we come to the skin. So let's take a little scientific detour and we'll come back to the skin. Most of us maybe got introduced to the concept of pH, which is a scale from acids to bases. Maybe in junior high school, you know, one day our science teacher handed us these litmus strips of paper and we were dunking it into different solutions, trying to see what color it would turn up. And if it was something kind of like yellow or orange, it was an acid. And if it was something kind of purpley or blue, it was alkaline or a base. So that scale of pH runs from zero to 14. Zero is down low as acids, up high or basic or alkaline, and right in the middle at seven is um, neutral. Things like water are neutral, for example. Well, our body has evolved to operate efficiently at a different pH depending on where you're at. Our stomach is the most acidic. That can be down at a two. And that's because, you know, our stomach needs to digest food and, and kill organisms that we bring in through our mouth. <clears throat> our blood is about a seven, so fairly neutral. And I, every single patient gets educated on this. And I always ask patients, you know, if you had to guess, where do you think skin would be? Of course, you know, nobody knows because we don't get user manuals. And so I say, if you need a clue, I'll give you one. And if they don't take a clue, everyone guesses neutral. If they do take a clue, I say covering your skin is something called a fatty acid mantle. And then I say, let's break down. What word did we just hear? Fatty acid mantle. Okay. We heard the word acid and that's the clue. That's the answer. Our skin is surprisingly acidic. It needs to be acidic to be healthy. Okay. So it's down at like a four or five is really where we want skin to be. Now let's pause and look at our Western hygiene protocol. You know, we're obsessed with cleanliness and for a lot of reasons that is good, but we tend to use soap and water multiple times throughout a day, especially like on our hands. And most people, you know, shower maybe about once a day and we're soaping up. Well, if we look at soap, soap is made with a substance called lye and we combine that with fat and there's a chemical reaction and we get soap. Lye is super alkaline. It's like at a 12. So all soap or cleansers by nature are alkaline. So now we look at the fact we want skin to be acidic and yet we are using water, which is a seven and soaps, which are quite alkaline. Some soaps can be as high as 12 in pH. So every time we wash our skin, we're stripping off the fatty acid mantle and we're raising the pH of our skin. So we're really compromising our skin. And most people then, you know, we talked about are putting on, you know, lotions and moisturizers with a lot of different chemicals um, that is more easily absorbed through the skin now. And we're really, our whole Western hygiene protocol is compromising our skin because it keeps stripping off the fatty acid mantle and then throwing off the pH by pulling it up. And I have never treated as much hand eczema as I did at the start of COVID because people were hysterically washing their hands with hot water and soap you know, 10, 20 times a day. And if you want a recipe for hand eczema, that's a great one. All you have to do is stop and the hand eczema will go away. But I just had this slew of, of hand eczema. And, you know, unfortunately, I think this kind of hypersensitivity to cleanliness and all the chemicals that we're using are, is really compromising our skin barrier and putting us at risk for skin issues. But as we talked about, there's, there's a lot of gut skin relation as well that's driving the, the bus on this. 
So I'm, I'm guessing it probably depends on the person, but as far as how frequent do you recommend showering or is it not a matter of don't shower daily, but just maybe be cautious about the soap that you use when you shower? Yeah, it's a combination of those things. So I definitely counsel patients to use more natural soaps. Uh, I, I counsel patients, read your uh, skincare products the same way you would read food. You know, most, most of us now are kind of wise to the fact that they can sneak stuff in food and we should look at labels if it's packaged and see what are we putting in our mouths or eating. Same thing with skincare. And if, again, if it's a long list of multisyllabic chemical names that you don't understand, you probably shouldn't be putting it on your skin. Uh, there's no need for products like that. With soap, you just need some basic five ingredients. Again, some nice plant oils. Sodium hydroxide is that lye that you know has to happen for the chemical reaction. I don't like fragrances, but maybe some natural essential oils. You know, just a couple of items in your soap with names that you recognize. Uh, so that's the first start is natural soaps. And then the second is um, I tell patients, you know, unless you really get out and get dirty, pits and palms. So what are our pits? Uh, you know, in, in our armpits and our groin, those are areas that, you know, could probably use the soaping once a day. And then certainly, you know, palms, so hands and uh, feet, you know, our hands, there is a very good reason to wash our hands and need to do it several times a day. Uh, if we use the restroom, you know, if we think maybe there's COVID exposure, uh, moms who are changing, you know, dirty diapers, anyone who's preparing, you know, raw meat, so we are going to wash our hands, but we're going to try to do it only when appropriate. And then I have patients follow up that soap with um, natural products that help reacidify the skin. So as soon as we're done washing, we can do things to help pull that pH back down again and kind of restore where the skin was meant to be. All right. Well, wonderful. Thanks again for sharing. So obviously, again, the chemicals you use, what, what you hopefully not using chemicals, but the products you use definitely can impact the skin. And let's talk about the gut. How about that gut skin connection? Yeah. So as a naturopathic doctor, I think I think naturopathic doctors has been talking about the gut you know, for upwards of 30 years and and the gut microbiome. And in case that's a term, a new term to your listeners, uh, the, the microbiome is the collection of organisms, you know, anywhere. And so the gut microbiome is the collections of organisms that are living in our gut. And we, we definitely have them. The average adult human has about three to five pounds of microorganisms living in their gut. The vast majority are bacteria, but there's a whole host of different types of organisms, including fungal, like candida yeast. Uh, there can be viruses, uh, protozoa, worms, archaea lots of different types of organisms. And the reason why we have those pounds of organisms is that we've co-evolved with them and they are really there to help keep us healthy. We can't survive without them and they can't survive without us. So as long as we've known, you know, we've, we've had them and we need them. When it is the right organisms, they keep us healthy. But when there is dysbiosis, which is basically a disruption of the gut microbiome of what's supposed to be there, they really put us at risk for illness. And, um, you know, as a naturopathic doctor who specializes in dermatology, I only treat patients with dermatological complaints. So I see a lot of kind of, you know, the spectrum of what's in the population, a lot of eczema, a lot of acne, psoriasis, rosacea, alopecia areata, which is an autoimmune attack on the hair follicle, um, vitiligo, an autoimmune attack on the melanocytes in the skin. And, what I have found is that I have to go in and treat the gut in order to treat the hair, skin, and nails. A hundred percent of my patients have that gut dysbiosis. And not only that, after doing hundreds and hundreds of these tests, I started seeing patterns by disease of different types of dysbiosis. So my patients with acne tend to have a set of at least three problems that keep showing up. And I call that the acne gut, as opposed to my eczema patients have a different set of problems that show up again and again in my eczema patient. So it's not just that there's gut microbiome dysfunction or dysbiosis. It really interestingly falls into patterns by disease. And um, it's intrinsically related. We 
I really can't, you know, the root cause of, of a lot of the skin illness is the problems in the gut. And so I can do some things topically to help the situation, but if I can't get an intestine, treat the gut, I'm not going to be able to get to the root cause of their skin issues. What type of testing do you do? Uh, like, do you do a comprehensive stool test or microbiome testing for the gut or both? Yeah, there's two main tests that I do on just about every patient. One is a, a comprehensive stool test and one is a urine test called an organic acid test or mm -hmm. OAT. And the reason I use those two, the stool test does an excellent job at showing me the uh, specific bacterial organisms that are living in the gut as well as a good overview of digestive function and protozoa. These, those are little single celled animal organisms that can exist in the gut. And for example, I see those in about half of my acne patients, but I don't find that the stool test does a great job on fungal organisms in the gut. So for that reason, I also use the oat organic acid test. That does a, a much better job on showing me things like candida overgrowth or molds uh, like aspergillus or fusarium. And maybe if there's indicators of if there's maybe some toxic exposure or methylation issues, which is related to an MTHFR gene, and it gives me some B vitamin status and some other information as well. So I use those two labs together to kind of try to paint a comprehensive picture of all the things I need to fix in the gut. So can you talk about the importance of diet when it comes to skin? Is there any specific diet that you recommend uh, or does it depend if someone's autoimmune or non-autoimmune? Yeah, so I think that there's some overarching principles to follow and then there can be some specific ones by various diseases. Um, you know, overarching uh, for all my adult patients, we're working up to 35 grams of fiber a day. I can go in and fix the dysbiosis that I see and I use herbs and supplements to correct it. I don't use pharmaceuticals 99% of the time, but I can't keep things healthy if the fiber isn't there <clears throat> because most of <clears throat> the healthy organisms in our gut, their food is fiber and we want nice big colonies of these healthy ones. And just like any organism, you know, if you don't feed them, then they kind of die. So you know, most uh, Americans, the, the sad or standard American diet is pretty low in fiber. Most people are not at 35 grams of fiber a day. So we really work on that because ultimately I want to get them off my schedule and I want to keep their gut healthy. And the fiber is really that path forward for them. Do, for do you mainly, uh, I'm sorry, I was going to ask, do you mainly accomplish that through vegetables as far as the, the fiber? Yeah, it depends. If we're working with teens or kids and fruit is the only kind of plant that they're really willing to eat, I, I kind of call that my gateway fiber drug, right? We'll start with, with anything we can get. But for adults who maybe have a little more self-control, really vegetables you know, are the key. I, I know there's a lot of debate over legumes for various reasons. I like beans and legumes. They are very high in fiber. Um, all of the blue zone populations in the world, which means um, populations who... Uh, who have centenarians or people who live to the age of 100 more than other populations, they all tend to have beans and legumes in their diet. So I, I do think that they are beneficial, uh, but we really work on a variety as well. Um, variety is not just the spice of life. It, it is crafting a healthy gut microbiome. So the two uh, targets are 35 grams a day and 30 different plants a week. That includes spices, herbs, teas, nuts, seeds, we just don't want people eating the same thing day in and day out. Uh, so those are the two kind of elements I work on. And yes, definitely low sugar, which is the vegetables. That brings me to, you know, the next point for skin, sugar <clears throat> ages you, it ages skin. There's something called glycation. And if anyone's ever had a hemoglobin A1C test, then you have been testing glycation. A hemoglobin A1C tests basically how much sugar is attaching to your red blood cells. And when it's very high, people have diabetes, right? They're eating too much sugar. There's too much sugar in the blood and the sugar has nowhere to go. So it starts attaching to things like our red blood cells, but it also attaches to skin cells. And when you have glycation or sugar attaching to skin, think of it like kind of like a crispy, crunchy caramelization. It, it literally makes for crunchy skin. So the more sugar somebody eats, 
the more they're going to age their skin. So I really recommend low sugar if you want healthy, um, you know, naturally younger looking skin. And, you know, all the vegetables that we talked about, all of those nutrients are going to feed skin. Uh, fruits and vegetables that are uh, rich in bright colors, they contain things called polyphenols. Those are fantastic, both for the gut microbiome and for skin health. So luckily, it's the things that we're doing for gut health and overall health. Those are the things that are going to build healthy skin. And um, sometimes I will supplement patients with collagen. <clears throat> there are studies, very good studies at this point that show that uh, at least three to four months of supplementation with like a high quality collagen will help uh, reduce wrinkles and improve um, elasticity and, and suppleness of skin. Okay. So you just have them like add it, maybe a scoop or two, a collagen powder to a smoothie or just water per day. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, people can also drink, you know, high quality bone broth and that will get you a lot of collagen as well. Okay. And you said, so 30 different types of plant-based foods per day, uh, not per day, per week to get your fiber. And that's not just vegetables, but you mentioned other plant-based foods like legumes, nuts, seeds, correct? Yes. And herbs and spices. The more people cook with herbs and spices, they're just so rich in um, really things uh, like, you know, if you look at the ORAC scale, which is like an antioxidant scale, something like cloves is one of the highest. So cooking with herbs and spices, it makes our food taste great and it's really good for us. And it's really easy to get to 30 different plants a week when you're cooking with herbs and spices. And then when it comes to vegetables, do you recommend specific vegetables like, you know, uh, maybe more cruciferous vegetables compared to like green leafy vegetables? Uh, really, it comes down to diversity, like all mm. of them, right? Like people want to say like, oh, okay, well, I eat a lot of kale. I mean, that is fantastic. Kale gives you, you know, a lot of nutrients. But again, we don't want to just eat kale. So what I instruct patients is to eat the rainbow. And by that, um, I tell them when you when you go to the market or the farmer's market, and if you have kids, you can play this rainbow game with them. Go to the produce section, do your normal shop, get this stuff into your basket, <clears throat> and then go through the colors of the rainbow, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. You look in your basket and you see which of those colors are missing. And then you're going to go back out and you or your kid is going to pick a vegetable, hopefully, from that color group and get it in the basket. So, and, and worlds of color will start to open up. So let's say, okay, there's no purple. Look around and, and then this world of purple will bloom before your eyes and you're gonna see, okay, there's purple onions, there's purple carrots, purple broccoli, purple sweet potatoes, purple regular potatoes. I mean, really, it's just like this, this world just blooms before your eyes and you can try different things and that way you're gonna build in the diversity. So. It's really about having different things in the diet and all the different groups. So, right, we definitely want cruciferous vegetables. We want green leafy vegetables. Uh, we want, you know, orange things like carrots or squash. We, we want diversity. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't know if you heard of Dr. Jason Horlick, um, but uh, he's a, also a naturopath. And uh, he, he talks about what I, when I went through my master's in nutrition, he was talking about eating 40 different types of I think he was just focusing on vegetables, honestly, not just plant-based foods. So like 30, 30 different types, including nuts, seeds, legumes, to me is attainable, but 40, if it's just vegetables, is very difficult to get 40 different types per week. Um, so uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I, I do what you say. I try to, you know, I eat green leafy vegetables, but then also cruciferous vegetables and try to, uh, you know, probably, probably could do, just like most people probably could do an even better job than I'm doing now. So I'm glad you share that. And how about probiotics? When it comes to probiotics supporting the gut microbiome, do you recommend for people to get it more through the food they eat, like through fermented foods or probiotic supplements, or again, a combination of both? Yeah. And I think you mentioned Jason Harler, or I know I'm mispronouncing that, but he, he's a probiotic guy. Um, you know, I, I think when it comes to probiotics, people can kind of overestimate, right? I have a lot of eczema patients or eczema infants whose you know, moms come to see me and they're like, I have them on a probiotic, but it's not working. Like thinking that somehow the probiotic is gonna be magical and fix everything. And that's not the way it's gonna work. I definitely think eating fermented foods and getting probiotics naturally in our diet, you know, it's always the best to get it from our diet. 
Um, but I do think there's a role for probiotics in helping, and I do prescribe a lot of probiotics. There's kind of different types of probiotics, and I use different ones in different people. But you know, definitely, I'm always recommending again those fermented foods, so things like sauerkraut or natto, um, <clears throat> even you know small amounts of kombucha, so we're not getting too much sugar. For probiotics, uh, for little ones, for kids and breastfeeding moms and infants, um, you know, the most common strains are the ones you'll get in the refrigerator section. So they're strains of lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, bacteria, and those I find work best in kids. Again, that's not usually going to magically clean up the eczema, but part of a comprehensive protocol, it can be helpful. For adults, I like bacillus strains. Those are known as spore or soil-based probiotics. Those are a little bit different. I don't use those in kids and breastfeeding moms because I found that, that those species don't work well in the guts of little ones. Um, and then there's kind of more specialty strains. So there's a bacteria called Acromancia mucinophila, um, which is kind of a, a keystone species. In its name, mucinophila tells us it, it's a mucinophile, it loves mucin, and it helps prevent leaky gut. And there is a company that makes uh, Acromancia. Sometimes I prescribe that as well. So I use a variety of probiotics, but it's never just going to be the only thing I recommend. It's part of a comprehensive plan where I'm treating the issues that I saw in the stool and oat tests using a lot of herbs and supplements to kill off unwanted organisms. And then, of course, trying to regrow and rebalance the gut um, kind of more towards the, the back end. So with the Akramantia, I, I assume you, if you recommend it's based on it being low on a comprehensive stool test? Exactly. Um, if it's either low or missing, a lot of patients show up with uh, below detectable limits, which basically means it wasn't found. We don't think that it's that there's not, you know, a single, you know, spore or, you know, a something of Akramantia, but it's just so low, it's not coming out on the stool test. And Akramantia is kind of a delicate bacteria. So it can get to that point where it's low or not found with antibiotic use. You know, there's collateral damage in the gut. Uh, antibiotics can be life-saving and amazing and wonderful. Um, but at the same time, you know, they can kill off um, beneficial organisms like acromancia. And a lot of patients who aren't eating enough fiber, you know, or if they're doing for a long time, a low FODMAP diet or like a keto paleo diet, and there's really no fiber, um, that also can, can lead to low or no acromancia. Now, when it comes to, you mentioned dysbiosis imbalance in the gut flora. So that doesn't just pertain to like low back, good bacteria. Um, you mentioned candida overgrowth, which you use the organic acids test. How about gut infections like H. pylori or parasites? Do you see those leading to skin issues in your patients? Yes, 100%. H. pylori. Um, and just so your listeners know, that is a bacteria that lives in the stomach. Um, H. pylori, I find in almost 100% of my acne patients. So I mentioned there's an acne gut. The acne gut is almost all of them have H. pylori. And it doesn't even need to be massive amounts. It can just be low levels that are present. Uh, they also have candida overgrowth. And then half of my acne patients have something called protozoa. So they are a type of parasite. Protozoa is Latin for first animal. So these are eukaryotes, which is in the animal kingdom, and they're single-celled organisms. Um, and so, you know, definitely my acne patients are going to, I'm expecting to see H. pylori in them. Um, rosacea has pretty strong connection with H. pylori and something called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Uh, so I see a lot with them. I see a lot of H. pylori in psoriasis patients. And, and it can show up. I mean, it can show up in my eczema patients as well. So the stool tests that I use uh, test H. pylori standard. Uh, there's a lot of different bacteria that are tested for. And so, you know, I see everything from pathogens like, you know, C. difficile or even enterohemorrhagic E. coli can show up. But, you know, even things like Pseudomonas comes up a lot or Morganella or Klebsiella. Those are high histamine producers. Uh, so in my eczema patients, that high histamine level being cranked out in their gut is driving that allergic response and itch. Um, so yeah, you see a lot of different things. And I don't usually see worms, but protozoa can show up um, in patients in, in terms of parasites. But I feel like a lot of people have this idea that they need to do a parasite cleanse, a parasite cleanse. 
that's not really what I see in my experience with skin. It's, it's much more just that there is dysbiosis. There is overgrowth of these unwanted organisms and not enough or lacking of the good guys. And we need to switch that around um, and, and heal up the gut. But I think you did say there are times when you use like herbal antimicrobials for like every, for every time I do. Yeah, you do. Okay. So with, with, with protozoa or H pylori, you mentioned pseudomonas or these uh, other um, bacteria, well, protozoa, not bacteria, but these microorganisms. So you do use um, pretty much every time it sounds like some herbal and an herbal antimicrobials. I do. Yes. And you know, the types, I herb, uh, types of herbs that I use vary by the organism I'm trying to address. And I usually see patients every two to three months for follow-up visits. And the plan changes every time. So we're working through different things. And that's why, like, you know, at first when I sit down and I'm assessing the stool and the oat test, I'm kind of like making a list in my mind of all the issues. And then I'm kind of sorting them in terms, in terms of like order of importance. Like, what do I need to go after first? And so that will be, you know, maybe addressed in the first protocol, like, okay, you know, I want to um, address, you know, massive, massive candida overgrowth. So I'm going to use a lot of antifungal herbs to start. But now for the second plan, I really want to go after that H. pylori. So it's a different set of herbs and supplements. And we're really focusing on the H. pylori this time. And then, you know, maybe the third visit is more, okay, let's, let's go after these protozoa and some bacterial you know, the nice things about using herbs is they are what's known as broad spectrum. So <clears throat> they address a lot of different issues, even though we have herbs that are really good at addressing fungal organisms or really good at addressing things like protozoa, like parasites, they're still going to cast a wider net and still, you know, work with bacteria or other things. That's not true with pharmaceuticals. You know, pharmaceuticals um, are what are known as they're in classes. So if you use an antibiotic, it is only capable of killing bacteria and only certain types of bacteria. And you can actually get problems like a lot of women who take antibiotics will then get vaginal yeast infections. And the problem is that the pharmaceutical antibiotic has killed off the beneficial bacteria in the vagina that was keeping the microbiome normal because we have a, a microbiome everywhere, including in the vagina. And then you can get fungal overgrowth. Um, so then you need to use an antifungal. Well, antifungals are going to only kill off fungal elements, not bacteria or viruses. And then if you have a viral, you know, you need an antiviral. The beautiful things about herbs is the broad spectrum. Plants need to exist out in nature and fight bacteria, viruses, fungal elements, parasitic elements. And so we don't tend to get those kinds of symptoms and overgrowth when we're using herbs. And so even though I'm like, okay, this is maybe a protocol that's focusing on the protozoa. It's not that I'm completely ignoring the fungal or bacterial overgrowth, and I'm not going to be driving problems with these other types of organisms. Um, so obviously I'm an herbalist and a naturopathic doctor, um, but I really do love using herbs for that reason. Now, are there any supplements that you give directly for the skin? I mean, we spoke, you spoke about probiotics uh, for the gut. You spoke about, we just spoke about herbal antimicrobials. Uh, I guess it doesn't even have to be directly for the skin. If there are, that's great. But any, like, do, do you recommend things to reduce toxic load, which might, you know, relate to, uh, you know, the skin issues or, I mean, of course, I'm sure you give, you recommend other, many other supplements depending on the situation, but are there maybe a few common ones that you recommend that you find to be helpful? Or like I said, any that you recommend, like I, I heard of is silica, um, as far yeah. as like for skin health, anything like that, uh, you mentioned collagen, I know collagen powder. Yeah. I mean, aside from supplementing with collagen powder, you know, my, my goal as a naturopathic doctor is really to restore function to the body. And, you know, most of the time, if I can clean up the gut and, you know, make their system healthy again, their skin is going to be healthy. So I don't, usually give like skin supplements. Now that being said, you know, I'm, I'm looking at labs and stuff. So if it looks like they need liver support, there's, you know, the liver obviously is our main organ of detoxification and it, it relates to skin health. So if they need liver support, you know, I might give, um, supplements like burdock, um, dandelion, artichoke, um, something like glutathione or NAC and acetylcysteine that can support the liver and thereby support the skin. 
Um, I tend not to give like hair, skin and nail supplements because I just really don't need to. You know, if people are getting proper nutrition, if all their organs are functioning properly and if we're doing things topically on the skin, like we talked about, like not really messing with the pH and restoring the pH with things like aloe vera gel or hydrosols are uh, water based plant extractions. It's part of the essential oil making process. It's kind of like a tea teas on the skin, uh, diluted apple cider vinegar, and then using plant-based moisturizers to moisturize the skin. That is really all you need, you know? And also, you know, we talked about not eating a lot of sugar, not eating a lot of junk, the healthy diet, your skin is going to look um, and feel great naturally, as long as we're supporting all the systems. We really don't need to throw a lot of like vitamins and, and stuff like that at it. Yeah, I'm glad you said that just because there are times when, you know, my patients will ask me, well, can I have a sub, not so much for the skin, I guess sometimes, but especially for the hair, can I have like a, you know, hair supplements? And we, I, I, I say the same thing. I mean, you know, trying to address what's causing the hair loss. Is it a thyroid hormone imbalance or is it a nutrient deficiency, which might be tied to the gut? So, uh, so I am glad you, you mentioned that. And then I, I guess the last question I have is when it comes to skincare products, um, I, I think you, you said you do have your own line. Um, I do not, no. Oh, okay. I, well, how do you recommend people finding, like do, uh, there's databases like the Skin Deep database. Do, do you recommend people using, you know, like databases like that and apps to like look at ingredients as far as like finding clean products? Yeah. I mean, obviously for my patients, I'm giving very specific recommendations on very specific products for their condition. But, you know, in general, I do think that that um, environmental working group skin deep database is helpful. And I, I don't agree with every single thing that's in there, but it, it's a good guideline. Um, the reading, reading the ingredients and getting up to speed on things is there's really no substitute for it because even sometimes within a brand, there will be one specific product, which I will use within a brand. And then another specific product I won't use because I've read the labels and this one is totally fine. And this one has stuff I do not want my patients putting on their skin. What's difficult, I think, about the product market is it's just not very well regulated in the United States. And it really is buyer beware. Like, a lot of chemicals that we can have in our products here in the United States are banned from Europe and other countries. And so the same product that you might buy by the same manufacturer, if you buy it in Europe, it's actually a better, healthier product than if you buy it here because Europe has banned a, a specific substance. And so it's not in the European product, but it's cheaper. So they will put it in the American product. Um, things like fragrance. I don't recommend that patients use anything with fragrance in it. Fragrance is a catch-all for over 2000 chemicals. They're basically untested and a lot of them are quite toxic. Um, I have a site called Root, uh, Root Cause Dermatology and for free, uh, your listeners can uh, sign up for a video on this exact topic. Like what kind of skincare products should they be using? What should they be looking out for? Um, and if they go to Root Cause Dermatology and just put their email address in, they'll get a free video. It's about 15 minutes about me talking about this exact topic and, and how to really look out for themselves and, and get healthy skincare products. But education, reading the labels, and um, you know, I would say only buy products that you know what those ingredients are. The only exception is um, natural products have to have the common name and the Latin name. So, <clears throat> you know, for example, something may list rosemary and then rosemarinus officinalis next to it in italics. That's fine. That's just the Latin name. But if it's a lot of multisyllabic chemical sounding names and you don't know what it is, it's probably things like um, parabens, emulsifiers, preservatives. And a lot of those, they're the endocrine disruptors. They're the things you really want to get out of your products, particularly if you have thyroid issues. Um, and if you know what all the ingredients are and you see things like, oh, okay, that has, you know, lavender essential oil and aloe vera gel and shea butter and, you know, coconut oil, you know what those things are. Your body knows what those things are. Those are not going to contain endocrine disruptors. Those are not going to mess with your thyroid. 
All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And yeah, definitely visit Dr. Greenberg's website. Root, you said root cause dermatology, uh, root cause dermatology.com for that free video. And uh, is there anything else that I didn't ask you that you wanted to, to chat about? I know we covered a lot, but I wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything that you specifically wanted to, to cover. Yeah, I realized when I was talking about the food that, you know, I didn't really talk about gluten. Um, the stool test that I use does have a gluten sensitivity test. This is different than testing for celiac disease or a food allergy. A sensitivity is, you know, that you have issues with it. And um, I bring it up because, you know, a lot of, of thyroid patients and Hashimoto patients have issues with gluten. Um, if that marker comes up in my patients, I do have them eliminate gluten. Gluten can trigger something called zonulin. Zonulin contributes to a leaky gut. Um, so gluten is an issue for some of my patients, and especially if they have thyroid disease, because a lot of my patients, you know, uh, you know, thyroid is, is obviously the number one autoimmune disease. And so a lot of my patients have skin issues plus uh, thyroid and autoimmune diseases go together. So especially if they have something like an alopecia areata or a vitiligo, you know, they're, they're more likely to have something like an autoimmune thyroid disease. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think we eat too much gluten in our diet. I don't think everyone needs to completely eliminate it, but I do think it's helpful to know if you do have a gluten sensitivity and if so, to really cut it out completely. There's so many other um, grains and options. Um, and, you know, it just some people are just eating gluten morning, noon and night. And it's really not great for their gut, their thyroid, or their skin at the end of the day. How, how about dairy? Do you uh, does that depend on the person, or usually you, you let people eat dairy? Or uh, it depends. About a hundred percent of my eczema patients should not be eating dairy. I've never met an eczema patient where dairy does them any favors. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, we are not baby cows, and so that is not an appropriate food source. You know, I kind of tongue in cheek ask my patient, you know, my adult eczema patients like, oh, you know, so you're still breastfeeding from your mom. And of course, they look at me like I'm completely insane. And the reason is, you know, if we were meant to drink dairy as adults, we would still be breastfeeding. But no mammal on the planet breastfeeds past infancy. Every mammal mama cuts off the baby at a certain point, And that mammal will never ever have milk again and will never drink the milk from another species we like milk because it's it's delicious and it makes things like cream and cheese and it, it releases endorphins so there's even an addictive nature but none of my eczema patients and none of my acne patients should be drinking milk um, some people can get away with it but it's it's really not an appropriate food source we, we weren't meant to drink um, dairy as adults and we weren't meant to drink dairy of other species so Dairy and, and gluten are, are not my favorite. Again, some people can get away with it, but they're not great food sources. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And so can you just take a minute to wrap this up and just maybe some action steps if someone, you know, with Hashimoto's or Graves disease listening to this or, you know, another, you know, health condition, a non-autoimmune thyroid condition listening to this, uh, you know, obviously working with a practitioner such as yourself is an option. But what are some initial steps even before that that they should do? Yeah, I think we break it up into topically and then internally. So topically, again, the best thing you can do, turn those personal care products over. Start reading labels. Ask yourself if you understand what's in it. And if you don't, think twice about whether you should be using it. There's lots of good options and you can start, you know, with my course uh, or, you know, the environmental working group skin deep uh, database to start to educate yourself. So that's for topicals. For internals, really, if you can get 35 grams of fiber a day and 30 different plants a week, a lot is gonna change. Uh, your thyroid symptoms are gonna improve, uh, your gut is gonna improve, your skin is gonna improve. It is the, the way we were meant to eat and there's, there's nothing we can do to get around that. Um, so I think those two things, you know, topically read your labels, focus on 35 grams and 30 different plants a week, you would see big changes in your skin health and your thyroid health just with focusing on those two things. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Greenberg. And where can people find out more about you? You said your, your website, rootcausedermatology.com. I know you have some courses um, besides the free video. There are other um, courses that you offer as well, correct? 
Yeah. So on, on root cause dermatology, I have a course on eczema, acne, rosacea, hair loss, and something called seborrheic dermatitis and dandruff. Um, if you live in California, Oregon, or Washington, those are states where I'm licensed and where I can legally see patients. My clinic site is integrativedermatologycenter.com. So if you're in California, Oregon, or Washington, and you're interested in potentially seeing me as a patient, you can go to integrativedermatologycenter.com and sign up for a free 15-minute consult, and I can talk to you about your condition and kind of how I treat. All right. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much again for, for doing this. Appreciate it. And um, yeah, learn, learns a lot. I'm sure the listeners did as well, as far as uh, root causes of um, dermatology. Thanks so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you.